Uh, Assalamu alaikum. I'd like to welcome you to the Center for South Asian Studies at UC Berkeley to the launch of the Bangladesh Initiative at Berkeley and to a lecture by one of the world's most eminent economists, Dr. Rehman Saban. Dr. Saban's lecture is entitled Challenging the Injustice of Poverty, uh, an Agenda for Inclusive Development in South Asia. My name is Lawrence Cohen. I'm a professor in the Department of Anthropology at Berkeley and the Joint Program in Medical Anthropology with UCSF and the director of the Center for South Asia Studies here. Uh, before, I act, um, uh, before I ask uh, my colleague, Dr. Sachita Saxena, to introduce um, um, our honored guest, I want to say a few words. First, to thank our co-sponsors for tonight's event, the Blum Center for Developing Economies, the Center for Effective Global Action, and Berkeley Aid uh, for co-sponsorship. And second, I want to say a word about Bangladesh at Berkeley. From the beginning of the 20th century, in the first decades of this great university, young scholars from Bengal, both east and west, played a role in its intellectual community and in offering a powerful critique on how the American University studied Asia, and specifically Bengal. For Berkeley, as elsewhere in the United States in the 1960s, the cause of an independent Bangladesh became an unexpected site of popular cultural attention if all too briefly. By the 1970s, a strange situation had emerged in which some of the most important public health research projects globally depended upon the rural poor of Bangladesh as a kind of critical laboratory for knowledge and um, clinical instruments. But this dependence and the importance of Bangladesh did not extend to the establishment of broad-based scholarly ties across the disciplines between the two countries. Despite the resurgence of interest again and again in Bangladesh with the growing attention, for example, to microcredits, and more recently to textile growth and working conditions, no United States university has made a commitment to building such broad-based and mutual intellectual ties with scholars in Bangladesh. It is our hope to achieve this vision of a rigorous and vigorous Bangladesh studies at Berkeley. A growing number of Berkeley faculty are continuing or beginning research in and also collaboration with Bangladesh. These faculty have made the Center for South Asia Studies an emerging site for Bangladesh scholarship with workshops, lectures, and conferences, and most recently the development of close and fruitful ties to the Bangladesh Development Initiative, for example, with the BDI conference here at Berkeley last semester. Several years ago, under the guidance of my predecessor, uh, chair of Sociology and former chair of this center, Raka Ray, uh, it's her anniversary today along with her partner, Ashok Bardhan. The um, um, faculty and community came together to create a Bangla initiative to ensure that the teaching of Bengali would be secure at Berkeley at the introductory and advanced levels. This initiative has almost completed its goal and so very soon uh, Bangla will be uh, ensured for the foreseeable future as a language taught in this university. Uh, and I want to thank all present here who have contributed to the Bangladesh Initiative, for which we are immensely grateful. Um, and it has led us in turn to the broader and urgent challenge of expanding scholarship on Bangladesh and more extensive mutual engagement. This vision of Bangladesh studies at Berkeley, uh, as you'll hear in a moment, is due to uh, one man, Dr. Ahmed um, Badru Zaman, who I'm going to, after the talk today, ask to speak. Um, but I'd like to ask my colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Sajita Saxena, uh, to introduce um, our guest. Dr. Saxena is a political scientist uh, whose work has been involved comparatively um, uh, in close engagement with uh, work in Bangladesh. She is uh, at the heart of the commitment to Bangladesh studies at Berkeley. She's an extraordinary scholar and administrator. It is through her that the Center for South Asia Studies maintains its uh, immense commitments. And so I'd like to invite her to uh, speak. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. It is my great honor and privilege this evening to introduce Professor Rehman Soban. Professor Soban is among a handful of South Asian figures whose work has universal relevance and international respect, not only because of its clarity of vision, pragmatic realism and integrity, 
but his life's work focuses on making change in the lives of billions of people. Professor Soban is truly one of the most eminent thinkers and doers of our time. His professional life spans more than 55 years. He started his career as a faculty member of the Department of Economics at Dhaka University in 1957. He led Bangladesh's first planning commission from 1972 to 1974, and subsequently has held many positions at several think tanks and research organizations in Bangladesh, and visiting positions at universities like Oxford, Columbia, and Harvard. He was the founder and executive chairman of the Center for Policy Dialogue, CPD, from 1994 to 1999. And currently, he is the chairman of CPD which is considered to be Bangladesh's leading public policy think tank and is considered to be one of the top non-governmental research organizations in the world. Professor Soban has also received a number of awards, including the Bangladesh Bank Purushkar 2000, awarded to professionals in the field of economics in Bangladesh, and the Bangladesh Shodinata Purushkar in 2008, which is the highest civil award in Bangladesh. He has published 27 books, 15 research monologues, and around 140 articles in professional journals. Professor Soban's approaches to critical issues has always been on the cutting edge. Whether he questions international influence in the global south that has forced countries to move from being aid dependent to trade dependent, or whether he implores us to simply look beyond issues of factory compliance after the Rana Plaza garment factory tragedy, and asks us to examine the inherent inequalities that are built into global supply chains. He is what those of us out here in Silicon Valley would call an out of the box and innovative thinker. Today we are so pleased that Professor Soban will be discussing his latest book, Challenging the Injustice of Poverty, Operationalizing an Agenda for Inclusive Development Across South Asia. This book is a culmination of Professor Soban's efforts to understand the roots of economic exclusion across five countries over the last four years. It is a remarkable book in its depth and breadth, in its ability to make bold comparisons across countries in South Asia by providing rich data and highlighting successes and lessons learned. Most importantly, the book presents an agenda for change, what the constraints might be, and guidelines for piecemeal reform in several key areas which Professor Soban will discuss today. At its, core in his in, at its core is its insistence on identifying the source as opposed to merely addressing the symptoms of poverty. According to Professor Soban, poverty is not a given, but rather a consequence of an unjust economic system within which it is reproduced. He argues that as the case in Bangladesh and many other countries in the global south, the poor, of, poor are victims of structural injustice with unequal access to assets and marginalized opportunities for human development. And since the book is not simply focused on how resources should be transferred to the poor to have them deal with their poverty, he critically shifts, shifts the debate away from how much or how less the government should intervene in poverty alleviation programs. This is where most of the discourse around poverty seems to begin and end. As Lawrence mentioned, the center was privileged to be able to host the annual Bangladesh Development Initiative Conference on campus this past February. At that conference, um, BDI presented Professor Soban with a Lifetime Achievement Award. On that occasion, Nobel laureates Professor Amartya Shen and Professor Mohammed Yunus, both whom uh, Professor Soban has worked with closely, sent in congratulatory, congratulatory notes. I wanted to share excerpts from their notes as they are very revealing. Professor Sen wrote, it has been one of the great privileges of my life to know Rehman Soban well and benefit from his wisdom and insight as well as his warmth and affection. Rehman's understanding of the process of development as well as ways and means of defending the functioning of a democratic system is altogether unparalleled and I have been very fortunate to benefit from it. And Dr. Yunus wrote, as his former student and a close follower for his, of his for a long time, I had the privilege of seeing him as an outstanding intellectual leader, as a political thinker, as a passionate debater, as a researcher, as a writer, as an organizer, as an institution builder, and as a fighter for social causes. We can think of no one 
better to launch the center's focus on Bangladesh. Professor Soban challenges us to think critically about some of the world's most complex problems. He pushes us beyond our comfort zones, he compels us to take action, and most importantly, he inspires all of us to challenge injustice. Please join me in welcoming Professor Rehman Soban back to UC Berkeley. Thank you, Sanchita. I think uh, with that introduction, I'm quite overwhelmed uh, and fear the anti-climatic nature of the presentation I will be making to you. Uh, thank you again, and I greatly appreciate the invitation from the center to make this presentation. I'm particularly gratified uh, because uh, this is part of a process of putting Bangladesh back on the academic map. I think the big problem was that uh, we had our glory days going back to 1971, when uh, Bangladesh at its birth was in fact a part of a global agenda. Uh, but progressively now, whilst uh, we have made significant progress, uh, we haven't had uh, too many terrorists to excite the imagination of the world. And uh, we have done moderately well, so that in fact there have been uh, no major crises except the occasional natural disaster. Uh, so somehow or the other, Bangladesh being equated uh, historically with disasters has in fact fallen off the uh, media landscape. And more seriously, as far as we as academics are concerned, it has really fallen off the academic map. So what I think you are doing over here is a very important uh, contribution to, in fact, reviving academic interest in Bangladesh. Uh, we try to uh, help you in this process by uh, contributing uh, some thoughts which might excite people's imagination and persuade them to do more intensive research on the subject. Uh, but at the end of the day, all of you assembled over here, the Bangladeshi community in particular, uh, have the responsibility of igniting the interest and imagination of uh, serious researchers. I'm, in fact, uh, deeply impressed by the fact that uh, Professor Alan Dejanbury is, in fact, here, and is here, amongst other reasons, because he has actually engaged himself now in a research venture uh, relating to Bangladesh. So uh, when people like him, when people like Pranab and others can engage themselves in this area, I think this is really what we look forward to. I think uh, with these words, uh, let me get on with uh, the business of my presentation. Uh, uh, I'm uh, using a PowerPoint, but I wish to point out that uh, technologically I belong to the Stone Age. So in fact, uh, uh, how this will actually work, I'm not entirely sure, so keep your fingers crossed. Ah, not too bad. Right. OK, thank you. And now, Sanjita, of course, has given a better introduction to my actual presentation that I could do myself, because I'm very bad at summarizing anything I actually have to say. So I appreciate the fact that she has already given you a preview. Uh, and uh, what I'm spelling out over here is a discussion on how the South Asian approach to poverty has in fact been caught up in a particular framework of reference where the focus has really been on addressing the symptoms rather than the source of the problem. And I try to structure it in terms of these issues of uh, the South Asian approach and uh, the impact of this approach on the agenda for poverty, and then try to reconceptualize the issue and put forward some ideas on how we may actually change the discourse. Now, my presentation basically seeks to differentiate between two approaches to inclusive development, because now if you look at the language of the development discourse, 
uh, inclusive development has become quite fashionable. In fact, the Indian 11th and 12th five-year plan uh, talk of inclusive development. And in fact, uh, Pranab will recollect when we were both present together at a conference on social democracy for India, uh, we were already told by the Prime Minister and the Deputy Chairman of the, Prime, of the Planning Commission of India that India was already on the path not only to inclusive development, but even constructing a social democracy. So it struck me then that there may be some sort of conceptual problems over here which should be addressed. Now, the traditional approach for what passes for inclusive development uh, includes the poor or in the benefits of growth and development. This is a breakthrough in the sense that previously growth and its trickle-down processes were seen to be adequate. I see that a big debate is going on internationally between my two friends and contemporaries from Cambridge, Jagdish Bhagwati and Omar Prasen, on this particular subject. Uh, the uh, first approach basically recognizes that, okay, uh, the poor aren't fully participating, and so you need interventions which enable them to participate, and you have programs of social protection built in. The second approach to inclusion is premised, I argue, on the unjust nature of uh, South Asia's social order that we have to get to the source of the problem, and we need to put in place agendas for inclusion, which address the structural sources of uh, exclusion. Now, basically, social inclusion in the South Asian framework is largely conceived as interventions to provide social protection. This was traditionally the responsibility of the family, and we went through the decade of the fifth days and sixth days where you believe that if you had uh, uh, robust enough growth, uh, this would then be percolated down to the poor. Uh, the provision for social development was made by South Asian governments on a very modest scale, but systemic commitment to providing social protection to those who were uh, poor and excluded was a more recent phenomenon. These agendas were largely driven by political circumstances, where as you democratized your political processes, uh, it became important to cater to the large voting constituencies which constituted people from low income, and therefore you needed to adjust your allocative priorities. And address their problem, but this always became a resource-dependent exercise, and for many countries, perhaps India being less so, a lot of the interventions on behalf of providing protection were uh, sustained by aid flows. Now, the problem, as I said, was that anything which is really dependent on external resource flows is vulnerable to the variables which influence aid, and certainly in the uh, post-MDG process uh, initiated after uh, uh, to the year 2000, uh, aid flows remained well below what was actually promised, so that those who depended on it had significant problems. Now, <clears throat> the NGOs and the civil society organizations uh, emerged as important players beginning from the 80s in really attempting to address the problems of providing social protection to uh, the income deprived. And the more recent development which has taken place where rather than merely dependent, be dependent on the goodwill of government and NGOs, you now have a rights-based approach to social protection which is been inspired by major legislative interventions uh, in India. The uh, first of these was really the right to education, where in fact uh, uh, the compulsory education bill made provision of education to all a uh, legally binding process. This was followed up by the right to work, the uh, 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 rural employment guarantee scheme, which has also been universalized across India. And the most recent legislation 
which has, of course, been the most controversial. I mean, again, the lineups from the uh, uh, market oriented uh, development practitioners as also within India itself over the right to food where about 80% of the population of India is now legally entitled to uh, having access to heavily subsidized food grains. Now the main focus of realizing inclusive development was contingent on these uh, state underwritten interventions uh, the earliest of these was public employment generation programs. I remember the very first book I wrote as a young teacher and researcher related to the rural works program of Pakistan at that time, which in the East Pakistan version was the largest uh, works program in the world, but which was heavily politicized and then degenerated uh, into a form of patronage-oriented corruption. But that version of the uh, employment generation uh, program to provide some degree of security was already there and has been carried out in various versions throughout the region. Provisions of food security were related in many cases to public employment generation, but it had its own sort of autonomous existence. Uh, then again, you've had uh, pensions for particular target groups. I mean, mostly in the South Asian context, this related to people with more secure access to workplaces. But in recent years now, both in India as well as in Bangladesh, particular target groups uh, such as uh, uh, widows, such as uh, elderly people, such as disabled people have in fact been uh, uh, given coverage. Then of course you've had the more substantive interventions of publicly financed provision of education and healthcare. Uh, again, India, uh, South Asia has lagged behind with the exception of Sri Lanka and the Maldives in this particular territory, but we have made significant progress in recent years. Subsidies for Agricultural inputs and utilities has been another form of social provisioning. Uh, targeted income transfer programs have been initiated, nothing on the scale of the Brazilian Bolsa Familia program, which in fact provides a more comprehensive income transfer program and has had a significant uh, contribution to the reduction of poverty. And of course, in the course of the last 30 years, the microcredit interventions, which are not government programs, but are largely driven by NGOs, though Grameen Bank itself is not an NGO, but an actual commercial bank. Now, I give you some uh, estimates of the coverage of social protection. I think the Asian Development Bank attempted to compile a social protection interest index and summary indicators for South Asia. I won't uh, dwell on these. These look at the comprehensive nature of the program, the degree of protection provided as uh, expenditure uh, as a percentage of GDP. Uh, so in most of these cases, the coverage has been narrow. And in fact, compared certainly to the East Asian countries, the degrees of social protection in South Asia have, in fact, been far from comprehensive. Now, the significant point I make as a critique of the social protection approach is that in spite of the commitment to MDGs, in spite of the poverty reduction strategy programs put in place uh, in the course of the last uh, decade and a half, social protection programs have not arrested the widening of income inequality and social disparities in any South Asian countries. In fact, uh, inequalities have increased, uh, while uh, poverty as a quantitative measure uh, in terms of percentages has uh, improved. Uh, it has still left large numbers of people in poverty. Social fragmentation and alienation in individual countries has aggravated which has accentuated communal tensions, uh, 
intergroup tensions, uh, and these growing social tensions have been manifested through increasing resort to violence as an instrument of political expression. In Bangladesh, in fact, now uh, those who are familiar with the scene see that a lot of this is spilled over into the garment sector, which is our great uh, export success story, uh, but has led to great disaffection on the part of garment workers who, in fact, feel excluded from the full benefits of this process. And no day goes by where there is not uh, rioting and violence on the streets uh, around the garment factories. Now, the political costs of these widening disparities are there for all to see. In an age when information is much more widely accessible, these growing disparities are more visible and provocative in the eyes of those who are excluded. I mean, if you are a person who walks two hours to work from your busty uh, to work in a garment factory for 10 or 12 hours and walks back at night and now uh, earning 30 to $40 a month, and you see the owners, in fact, uh, driving SUVs and living in luxurious homes, you feel that there is something wrong with this order and you're not willing to accept this. In most South Asian countries, these disparities are seen as unjust and they lack legitimacy in the eyes of most citizens. This is a very significant point. The expectations of citizens is for a more democratically elected regime, which we all claim to have, to narrow social disparities through ensuring greater justice in the development and governance process. Failure of elected governments to respond to the expectations of the electorate is fueling political instability and eroding confidence in the very democratic process itself. In fact, uh, where you have free elections in any country, there is a very high rate of turnover uh, amongst uh, elected governments. In Bangladesh, uh, we've had uh, turnovers in four successive uh, democratic elections. Now, the problem lies in the misperceived approach to social inclusion. The prevailing approach, I argue, seeks to alleviate poverty and to bridge these social divisions through these welfare-related transfer programs for social protection. This approach remains both resource constrained and even though it's rights based, it means that social protection, if it has to be comprehensive, will still continue to be resource constrained. Only you will com compromise quantity by in fact depreciation in quality of the protection offered. The approach, including the rights based response, I argue, addresses the symptoms of poverty and inequality, not its sources. Uh, now, the approach compensates in some small measure the victims of injustice, but it does not change the system which reproduces it. I'll give you a very uh, quick now, numerical implication of this. Uh, in India, uh, recently, they revised the uh, poverty line uh, through a committee headed by a leading economist, uh, Professor Tendulkar, which uh, revised the line from a dollar a day to a dollar 25 a day. Now, as a consequence of this revision, uh, 189 million Indians were reclassified as being below the poverty line. Now, what these numbers essentially indicate is that when we claim that we have reduced poverty by taking people above a poverty line, it doesn't really mean very much, because essentially it means that people who oscillate above and below these poverty lines uh, operate in a very narrow and fragile area of space where your life does not change, nor does your relationship. The South Asian model of social protection is without philosophical moorings beyond the goal of alleviating poverty. The European approach uh, in the post-war period associated with the welfare states of the social democracies had a very strong commitment to social transformation where you were wanting to create new areas of opportunity for the working class to graduate 
and be exposed to upward mobility. This model does not exist in the South Asian conception. Now, in my view, the, if you go to the source of the problem, I identify a number of areas which actually create the dynamic of exclusion. The most important I assign as the inequitable access to productive assets. That at the end of the day, however much you may provide uh, various forms of protection, if you don't have access to productive assets, this is the most important right that people demand, uh, you aren't going to really contribute to participating in an inclusive development process. Uh, area which is virtually unaddressed now in the development agenda is unequal competition in the market. You assume that a person owning two uh, bighas of land, that is in fact uh, two thirds of an acre, uh, can compete with a big uh, agricultural combine uh, in the marketplace. They operate in the local, lowest tiers of the market. They are exposed to the greatest vulnerability, the greatest insecurity, and the greatest injustices in sharing in the value which is added to their produce. Educational disparities have become another major divider in the region. I mean, it isn't that you had a highly equitable educational system, but there may be people around here who are old enough to remember that they came through uh, uh, Bangladeshi medium schools. Uh, they were educated in the rural areas. They went to district level schools. And from there, they could graduate to uh, become scholarship students and get PhDs in Harvard. My wife, uh, Professor Rona Jahan, had all her education in Bangla. Uh, up to her intermediate in these district schools, but eventually ended up at Harvard. Now, this possibility is virtually impossible in Bangladesh today, because the nature of a universalized educational system has meant a serious depreciation in quality and commitment in the pedagogical process. Uh, and this has been when we are attaining MDGs in quantitative terms, we are failing miserably in narrowing the gap between a privately educated elite and in fact a universally educated, uh, uh, you may say common arm army as they call them in India, or Jonathan as you call them in Bangladesh. Again, uh, similarly, you have inequitable access to healthcare. Again, uh, you realize certain MDGs, but the disparity between uh, privately accessed healthcare with the highest years not even staying at home, but going off to Singapore and even to the Mayo Clinic, and the ordinary people languishing in uh, a healthcare system. Information asymmetries, this again is a great divider within the system where knowledge itself becomes a resource and large numbers, the great majority, remain resourceless. Finally, I refer to the undemocratic working of the democratic process. We are all democracies in South Asia, but South Asia has increasingly become a democracy for rich men who can buy their way into the uh, legislatures and the various tiers of governance over there. Uh, again, this is a problem. And finally, we have the problem of unjust globalization. I'll briefly touch on this. It's a much bigger subject, and I don't want to elaborate on it, but I will address this in the context of uh, Rana Plaza's tragedy and uh, the Bangladesh garment industry. Now, I identify a selection of interventions based on my work to address these, because my view was that it's all very well to pose a major and fundamental critique of existing uh, policy agendas, but at the end, you have to put ideas in place. One of the big weaknesses of the left uh, in the sort of post-Soviet era in South Asia has been that they have been completely devoid of ideas. So they end up basically by becoming uh, extreme social protectionists, demanding larger shares of the budget for social protection, but with no structural ideas to be put on the table to address the sources of the problem. 
Now here I identify a range of interventions. Uh, one is strengthening the capacity of the excluded to compete in the marketplace. Actually, there are ways in which you can do that. Secondly, enabling them to share in the value addition process, that it isn't enough to just produce grain or soya bean or cotton from your uh, one or two acres of land. There's a whole process of value addition ending up in the cloth, ending up in the uh, soya bean oil processing system uh, where they need to be given access to share in its benefits. Then we talk about expanding the ownership and control over the, of the excluded over productive assets, addressing educational disparities, democratizing governance, or perhaps democratizing democracy. This again has to be part of that. And then uh, agendas for a more just globalization. Now, the main institutional instrumentality <coughs> that I identify over here relates to developing instruments of collective action which should be used as institutional mechanisms for investing the excluded with the strength and confidence to participate in the more dynamic sectors of the economy. By this, I mean that one of the greatest disabilities of exclusion is your individualization, the individualization of poverty in all its manifestations. That at the end of the day, if you want to transform the opportunities available to the excluded, you need to aggregate them so that they can uh, meet and participate in the market on more equitable terms with those who have the power and resources. <coughs> now here, I, in my book, draw upon a number of interesting models of collective action. Uh, India in particular has been particularly rich in this. I identify the initiatives taken by SEVA, the Self-Employed Women's Association, developed by uh, Ila Bhatt, uh, where about two million women basically have improved their conditions by coming together as trade unions in different areas and taking the advantage of collective action to move up market and to get better terms uh, out of a market system. The uh, uh, the self-help group, which in fact has done well in Andhra Pradesh, uh, the SERP is the name of the institution, the Society for Eliminating Rural Poverty, which brings together groups of poor women uh, with very few resources, but in fact again uses the collective model. Then another interesting model which I have discussed is the Lijat model. Uh, the Lijat model was where these 40,000 women uh, in, uh, in the Gujarat area, in fact, came together to, in fact, produce papa dams. Now, papa dams is a poor man's, a uh, poor woman's industry where you produce a few papa dams and you sell them on the roadside. Here you created a big corporate enterprise where 40,000 people produced the papa dams at home, but created a corporate entity which provided the intermediate inputs which were bought in bulk, which uh, provided quality control in the production process, which provided the packaging capacity, the marketing, the financial transactions, and converted these 40,000 women uh, into owners of an enterprise which was the largest popular producer in India. The Amul model, of course, was another example where two million uh, owners of one or two cows could come together and add value to that process, not just by collective buying and marketing, but by moving upstream in the production process until Amul itself was not only the largest uh, agro-processing enterprise in India, but it uh, inspired the white revolution where the same model, model was extended and applied and enabled India to become the largest milk producer in the world in what was known as the white revolution. 
Now, essentially, the importance of collective action is the need to create an institutional facility which is sufficiently strong to access the higher tiers of the market. A collective entity can be strong enough to assume organizational and fiduciary responsibilities for marketing the poorest produce, investing in value addition, which enables its members to share in the benefits of both backward and forward linkage. And ultimately, the main goal is to enable them to share in the value addition process. Now, I won't elaborate on this because uh, time is short. I talk about the self-help group approaches. Bina Agarwal has written about this, how they have come together to, in fact, buy land, go for joint production, pooling their land, leasing or even purchasing additional land. Now, the essential problem is that collective action can also be used to empower individual service providers to come together and derive external economies <coughs> which can enhance their competitiveness. A cooperative, I've given an example of a cooperative or collection or collective of rickshaw operators, street cleaners, micro entrepreneurs, street corner shops. All of these, you see them as isolated individuals being oppressed by the police, being exploited by the owner of the rickshaw, dying of tuberculosis uh, before you are 50. And you see that if you want to transform their opportunities, you need to bring together 50,000 pullers in a corporate uh, framework, where in fact they generate the externalities of a big transport company. You own your own workshop, you do the servicing of your rickshaws, you have lawyers who will represent you against police oppression, you have people who will negotiate uh, loans for you from banks, you will have a pension scheme, a healthcare system, all these will be there to provide, transform 50,000 individual oppressed uh, rickshaw pullers into a big competitive transport company uh, competing with other forms of uh, corporate transport organizations. Uh, <clears throat> now, I mentioned over here the whole value-added process. Uh, uh, I won't uh, go beyond that. I also mentioned that a number of initiatives have taken place even in the corporate sector. Uh, the What I call the corporate patronage model, where uh, the whole business of contract farming, elimination of the middleman, <coughs> the elimination of information symmetry, asymmetries have in fact been addressed. But the big problem with corporates when they move down this road, you've got the famous ITC's e Chaufal initiative where they in fact have set up these information kiosks all over India uh, to in fact encourage farmers to come in get market information, and then on that basis sell their produce to ITC, <coughs> which is much better than dealing with the Mundis and other traditional middlemen. But the big problem with this has been that at the end, the value added is still appropriated by ITC. <coughs> and the idea would be for ITC to take this program forward by in fact providing offers of equity partnership to the supply chain, which in fact actually is a part of this uh, uh, value addition chain that they have. <coughs> now in terms of ownership of asset, I suggest in the South Asian context, revisiting the whole issue of agrarian reform. Now we were part of a generation in which uh, agrarian reform was a very important agenda item, but now hardly anyone talks about it. I wrote a book on agrarian reform uh, way back in the early 90s. <coughs> At that time, no one addressed the issue of agrarian reform in South Asia. It was once a very big issue. Whereas Bengal's uh, uh, Operation Burger model, which was put in place in 1979, has been virtually uh, 
Much appreciated. Thank you. Was virtually arrested and has stagnated and has been some reversion in recent years. I noticed that in the Cameron Committee report, uh, which was put forward on the post-MDG agenda, uh, uh, Banerjee from MIT, in fact, has attempted to revive some discussion on the issue of agrarian reform, making reference to the West Bank Board Initiative, but no government in South Asia talks about it. So we suggest that we need to revisit it. There are large amounts of particularly what we call caste land or state-owned land, which have been feloniously appropriated by the powerful and privileged, which could be recovered. These could be uh, distributed and groups of landless households could be provided with credit and incorporate to, to own and operate tube wells, farm machinery, and to generate some of the externalities. In Bangladesh, for example, uh, most benefits now of any value addition are taken by the rice mill owners who uh, get all the benefits of subsidized procurement of grain. We would suggest that groups of farmers could be small farmers could be empowered to own small rice, automated rice mills, uh, where they could in fact become its owners and would be able to share the value added from that process. Now, <clears throat> we talk about expanding the ownership uh, of the poor into other areas. The Grameen Bank model, where the uh, organization is owned by its client borrowers, was a very important a development. Many people still think of Grameen as an NGO, but the significant point is it's owned by its own borrowers. And those of you who have been following the crisis related to Professor Yunus and the government of Bangladesh may keep in mind <coughs> that in spite of very difficult environment, these women have actually stood by their right of collective ownership and attempts to change the statutes and influence the appointments in the bank have been <coughs> resisted by these women as owners and members of the board so that they have become stakeholders in their uh, right and in their right of ownership. Now, Graveen itself is a major bank. It's the second largest private bank in Bangladesh. And it now has a capacity to, in fact, not just uh, extend uh, micro loans, but to aggregate these to enable its members to, in fact, become participants in uh, the upper tiers of the market. Another area of asset ownership which is identified in our work is relating to the opportunity of the workers themselves becoming partners in the growth and development process. Uh, where uh, we suggest, for example, that in the garment industry, which is an area of perpetual conflict in Bangladesh, where they are not only uh, disempowered, they don't even have the right to form trade unions. Uh, part of the tragedy they faced when uh, large numbers of workers, mostly women, were forced to enter a damaged building which collapsed around them and killed close to 1,500, arose from the fact that they had no rights. And they were told that if they did not go to work that day, uh, in spite of the threat to their lives, they could be disemployed immediately. And as one woman who was grievously injured said, what option did I have if I did not go to work that day? Uh, and had no job, who would feed my kids or pay their school fees? So we argue over here that this would not have happened uh, had they, in fact, had the capacity for collective action. And more to the point, if they were made stakeholders in that company, where they could have been given an equity stake in the company. So even if market forces compel you to earn subsistence wages, and your owners can become uh, multi-millionaires in dollar terms. If you want to change that particular environment, you can only do so by making these uh, women 
into uh, equity partners in companies where they can then directly share in the value added in profits from their labor. I give other such examples. I make a suggestion, for instance, that when land is acquired for development projects, the famous incident where uh, Tatars uh, were uh, forced to depart from West Bengal because of the conflict over land in Singur, that one of the critical approaches would have been that if anyone's land or resources are being appropriated, and they are being uh, disadvantaged by this process, whether by a mining company or whether by an industrial project, they should be given a long-term equity stake in that land. So it isn't that you just give them a bit of compensation and then they end up uh, uh, you know, owning rickshaws on the streets of Dhaka or Kolkata. But they become equity partners in that project and they have a lifetime rate of return coming in from every car which is sold or every uh, ton of coal or any other uh, uh, natural resource which is in fact mined over here. I suggest institutions such as dedicated mutual funds owned by poor people uh, <coughs> which could be used to mobilize their savings, use this to leverage uh, uh, loans from the banking system so that they can take up uh, equity positions in blue chip companies when they in fact actually come on the market. <coughs> uh, one of the ideas uh, which I put on the table over here is a corporate entity for overseas labor migrants who, which could be established in particular labor exporting countries in South Asia, <coughs> Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. This would attempt to end the individualization of uh, poor migrants who go abroad on highly exploitative conditions. I think now BRAC has a program of giving them loans, but that does not uh, end the uh, highly unequal relationship of the migrants. So we talk about the scope for collective enterprises where migrants, instead of being laborers, are transformed into labor exporting companies with the same capacity of institutional backup which will invest in their training, in covering the costs of their migration, in addressing their skill development, and negotiating their contracts and helping them to uh, productively invest their savings. <coughs> now, uh, quickly moving on from here, uh, we talk about the scope for upgrading the quality of public education. The emphasis here being that if you want to upgrade quality, you can't do it at low levels of investment that you do in South Asia. And more to the point, you have to address the problems of governance of a public education system. I think this is a problem where both uh, unions of school teachers have now become a powerful political resource which can, in fact, leverage all sorts of benefits without any reciprocal return in terms of upgrading their quality of teaching or, in fact, backing away from their investments in private tuition enterprises. Uh, of course, the ideal model would be the European system of a common school system, but I think in the reality of contemporary uh, South Asia, where private schooling has become a major, uh, a major home for the elite, uh, this would be more challenging. But more to the point is, a great deal more could be done, not only to upgrade public education, but also to, in fact, create spaces within the uh, private school system. One of the interesting and ignored elements of the Indian uh, compulsory education legislation was a provision that all private schools, including elite schools, had to reserve 25% of their enrollment for children from deprived families resident within the environment of the school. And then the cost of that would, in fact, really be borne by the government. It hasn't really moved forward at all. Uh, then, uh, democratizing governance. I don't think that I have the time to elaborate on this, I must bring it to a conclusion. <coughs> Finally, on 
what I call more just globalization. This is a huge agenda. Uh, those of you who are old enough, and I don't see too many would fall into that category over here, may represent the whole discourse of the 1970s on constructing a new international economic order. That sort of died a natural death uh, uh, at the end of the 70s, and you went through the age of market-driven globalization, and it had many positive benefits. I'm not uh, anti-globalizer in that sense of the term. But there were many downsides, and I will just dwell on one and bring my discussion to a conclusion. Uh, this relates to the whole nature of the unequal relationship within the globalization process. The whole Walmart, the whole tragedy which occurred in Bangladesh, I mentioned the incident where this building collapsed, four factories in jerry-built structures collapsed, derived from the fact that Bangladesh had become the second largest global garment exporter in the world. And they did so by being globally competitive and reducing costs. Now, the compulsion to reduce costs drove the bigger units to subcontract to smaller organizations outside the scrutiny of oversight in an imperfectly governed regulatory system. The economics of that process meant that you had to have casualized labor, you had to ensure that your overhead costs were low, that you did not observe uh, acceptable labor standards, and now you are being asked globally to correct all these. And I think you should. The ultimate burden is on Bangladesh to address this. But I conclude by giving you uh, some numbers. And these relate to the fact that what is no, not discussed by anywhere, I've noticed either in the development literature or in the international discourse, is the whole value chain of garment exports from Bangladesh. I got my colleagues at uh, CPD to look at the numbers. And they basically found that uh, if you look at a shirt from Bangladesh, which is sold at Walmart for 25 or 30 dollars in New York, about 60% of that value added is appropriated by Walmart. So that the whole issue of maintaining labor standards addressing improved wages, everything is devolved on basically about five to eight dollars uh, within that value chain. Now, obviously within that a great deal could be done, but what no one talks about is why does Walmart end up by getting 60% of the value added from the whole global market chain. Now, I ask all of you, both researchers as well as those engaged in global advocacy to address these issues. Is this a competitively derived process? Is it something associated uh, with the working of market forces? Or is there some form of globalized uh, institutional rent which is appropriated by the big retail chains? If we can look at a reappropriation of that 60%, we will be addressing both problems of better labor standards and working conditions for workers, as also issues of compliance. But to put the entire burden on Bangladesh to address this problem is part of the unjust uh, global system in which we operate. Of course, uh, I conclude by talking about restructuring global institutions, but. I've spoken probably for longer than I should have, so uh, let me bring this to a conclusion and argue that if you want a more just society, a society which is at peace and harmony with itself, operating in a more just global order, you will need to address the issue of injustice, inequity, and give people a sense of participation both in development as well as in democracy. The fact that we are conspicuously failing to do so has meant that in every corner of the world now, you are 
dealing with areas of serious disaffection, which are tending to become increasingly violent. And in an age of terrorism now, you have now developed the instrumentalities for giving expression to violence, which are assuming much more dangerous dimensions. And what you are really seeing is only, you may say, the tip of the iceberg. Thank you. I'd be happy to do it longer if uh, people have the patience. I have no problem. <laughs> So we'll open it up to questions. Yes. So it's great to listen to you because uh, you believe that it can be done. And uh, I, I think we all wish here that indeed it could, that your agenda, your agenda is very long. And, but I think that behind all of this, the key is competitiveness. You can actually use collective action, you can organize, you can empower, but as long as you cannot compete, you are not going to be successful in sustaining and in achieving all the income. So what we need in a sense is to recognize that being competitive in the context of the mobilization of collective action is something which is not easy to do. But unless we give ourselves as a goal to be able to compete, we are not going to be successful in achieving what you would like to see happen. No, I entirely agree with you on that, that in the whole nature of the intervention is to, in fact, uh, create a competitive capability uh, on the part of uh, the poor uh, through a process of collective action. Now, I'm very flexible in terms of the specific institutional entities you would create. Uh, but part of the process is also not just that organizations are exclusively owned by the poor, but that basically you want them to become partners in the corporate entities, which in fact are globally competitive. And we argue that their competitiveness will be greatly enhanced if their workforce or their supply chains are in fact made partners in this process because then they will become long-term stakeholders uh, in the uh, profitability of these organizations. But I recognize that the great challenge is to get competitive institutions because that certainly is the name of the game. And the idea is that the real nature of poverty originates in the lack of competitiveness of unequal, unequipped uh, individuals. And this is the problem that you're trying to address. Professor Burton, and then, and then two in the back. Um, Raman, I, I, of course, largely agree with what you said. Uh, let me take up uh, three issues, uh, which uh, are not really questions, but more comments. One is one of the things that you mentioned at the end about the um, global value chain. Some of us are working on it, actually. Oh. I, I have a paper coming out in American Economic Journal next month on exactly on this issue. Oh. Monopoly in the value chain, international value chain. Mm -hmm. uh, but in general, I've suggested, uh, not in that paper, that paper is more technical, but uh, in general, I've suggested that more than, you know, most of the people who don't like globalization go in the anti-trade direction. The important direction one has to go is some kind of international antitrust, anti-monopoly. Now, of course, there is no international organization to enforce, enforce it, but even collecting information mm -hmm. of the various restrictive monopoly practices of the retail chains, that itself will be of some value and on which a lot more work needs to be done. My, that was my first comment. Second, and this is where I'm quite frustrated, going back to the issue of collective action, particularly agriculture. Um, Bangladesh, as well as my part of India, West Bengal, are probably one of the world's most densely populated areas of agriculture. So what is happening in both parts, and certainly I've done some work on West Bengal. The average land size is now 
becoming so tiny that it's no longer worth cultivating. So a lot of people, people giving up their land because costs of cultivating are too high. But the only solution is very much in your line. Only solution is people to get together. Maybe not cooperative farming, but cooperative, I think, buying of inputs, selling, etc., etc. But my frustration is here. This is the obvious way to go for both Bangladesh and large parts of India, not just West Bengal. But the only, my frustration is that for the last 10 years, or more than 10 years, I have been talking to several leaders of the left party in West Bengal. Some of them are thinking about these things. But I remember, for example, a very thoughtful left leader in West Bengal told me, cooperate, cooperatives will not work. Said as soon as we talk about cooperatives to farmers, their minds shut down. They don't want to listen to us. I said that is no excuse for not pushing you, not trying to persuade them. But they essentially have given up. And that's a major failure, as you indicated, of the left to essentially how to uh, build up cooperativization, not of farming, but of these associative activities. Lastly, and this is something that you didn't go into. Uh, probably Bangladesh has less of a problem on this than India. And that is to do with employment. Uh, you might be interested, you know, last weekend I had a uh, thankless task of commenting on Jagdish Bhagwati <laughs> at a conference in Princeton. Oh. I was a reluctant, uh, <laughs> reluctantly mobilized into commenting on him. So obviously we had a lot of differences. So he, of course, is a big on growth. And I said, okay, but tell me, and giving Indian data, tell me, why is it that growth in India does not create jobs? There are a lot of data on that. There's hardly, with all the big growth, hardly any new jobs have been created. In the better job sector, not the you know, scrounging around kind of jobs in the informal sector. And then, of course, immediately things like you have to take out those labor laws, etc. And I, I was trying to show that labor law is not going to do enough. Do you have any idea? And Bangladesh has gone for this labor intensive industry with all the problems that you mentioned, which is government. But those labor intensive industries have not worked successfully in India, by and large. India's success stories are in highly capital intensive or highly skill intensive. Software, pharmaceuticals, uh, and now auto, uh, autos, etc. So, do you have any uh, thought about how to promote labor-intensive uh, industrialization? Thanks. Okay. Well, to move in reverse, I would have loved to have heard your uh, what Jagdish said in response. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I think this is an issue which I too have been looking at. And I think two things have actually struck me. Because this is a problem which has afflicted Europe and North America, and it has now afflicted the rest of the developing world. After all, the post-war beverage agenda, uh, full employment was a very central element of macroeconomic policy interventions in the post-Keynesian age. And uh, any country with an unemployment rate in uh, the capitalist world of above 3% was deemed to be in deep political trouble. Now you've got 25% unemployment in Spain and close to even larger in places like Greece. And the whole issue of full employment has completely disappeared from the development discourse in the European scene. Now similarly, in our part of the world, uh, employment generation was a major agenda item. You remember the models which Amorto and others would prepare about shadow pricing of labor and capital and all the rest of it. Uh, now, who talks about that? Uh, because now that public investment uh, employment strategies are not on the table anymore, uh, private investors are off the hook completely and they make their own uh, 
investment decisions, including the great advantages of uh, automation, where they treat labor not so much as a hike, as a cost, but as a liability. And so therefore, if they can in fact uh, disemploy workers, they would in fact do so without addressing the real costs of labor. So essentially, what I think you would need to apply your skills at is to see that what would a real employment generating strategy mean for countries like Bangladesh? I mean, the world, the ILO's uh, uh, decent work agenda and the World Bank's recent uh, WD uh, report on jobs has really not put together a comprehensive agenda. I mean, if you were to have a compulsory employment guarantee scheme, uh, could this be made into a major resource when you are really planning public investment outcomes, where in fact you build in work generation as part of a resource which could then uh, do that? I think this is an agenda which we all need to revisit. I think on the other two issues you have raised, I entirely agree with you on that, that uh, uh, the whole issue now of uh, land, of how to deal with the mini fundist farms which have emerged, can only be addressed through some form of aggregate intervention. In fact, I found that some of the self-help groups in the Andhra region uh, were in fact actually attempting to come together and to move up market in uh, collectively participating in marketing and production. But uh, that again has not really been built in as a strategic intervention. And again, your first intervention, I hope you will apply your mind if you're working in that area, on the whole issue of the logic of the value chain, because this is the big and unaddressed issue. So people of your, you know, academic skills, should, if you can really deconstruct the value chain, I think all that we can do at this stage of the game is to put the facts on the table and to widely publicize it so that people would actually know why what goes into the $30 shirt in Walmart, and who gets what out of it, and why do they get what they get. This is a, an unaddressed issue, and we need a global discussion on this now. So there were two more questions in the back. Um, and then be the last one. Um, so along with uh, what you were uh, saying. Please introduce yourself. Oh, sorry. Uh, my name is Rubel Sekhan. I'm a student at Berkeley and I'm working with an undergraduate, uh, I'm an undergraduate researcher working with a dissertation project on Pakistan and South Asian development in general. Um, so my question was, along with the research and publication of that research that you just suggested, what role can Western uh, partners or outsiders play, uh, if any, in getting the collective action development happening in South Asia? Well, uh, as a, you're Pakistani, I presume. I, I'm actually from India. But from India. India. But actually, if you are working on Pakistan, a uh, uh, person who I cite a lot because he's produced a number of papers on collective action possibilities in Pakistan is uh, Dr. Akmal Hussain, in which he has, in fact, uh, prepared papers on the issue of a form of agrarian reform in Pakistan drawing on the uh, state-owned lands. He's identified the acreage, the distribution, and then developed a whole program of collective action. And then he also has developed a similar body of ideas on uh, small and medium enterprises, because he basically has argued that the big weaknesses of the SMEs lies again in their lack of competitiveness operating as individualized units in a globalized marketing system. And that there are a whole range of externalities which could be generated for uh, common uh, area units, uh, which could in fact really enhance their competitiveness. So uh, I, uh, I, beyond citing Akmal's work, where he has given very creative ideas, 
I would then see that you should revisit Amul, you should revisit Lidjat, you would see the way in which the small could be aggregated and made into the large, and they could get all the external economies associated with size. The gentleman right behind. Akmal uh, said. Uh, in fact, I make a number of references to his work in my book. I'll leave a copy for the uh, library over here. Thank you. Uh, hello, I very much enjoyed your talk. Uh, I'm not at all an expert in this, this area. Uh, 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 hello, I'm, my name is David. I live in the neighborhood and uh, decided to come here. <laughs> so, so anyway, when you were talking about this, the fundamental you know, causes of poverty, um, it seemed to me that it boiled down to there's the powerless and the powerful. And which makes me wonder, ultimately, is are there forces at work, conscious or unconscious, which um, are benefiting from this situation, right? That, that ultimately there is this great number of the powerless, and they are being held down consciously or unconsciously because there is a benefit to perhaps those who are not powerless. Well, I agree with you. And obviously, those who have power uh, do so because it is advantageous to use that power, to see that that power is shared uh, as uh, you know, as limited a way as possible. I mean, the whole issue of uh, inviting workers to become your equity partners in the company, uh, obviously, you are not only sharing your profits, I mean, sharing profits through employee stock option plans is not a new process. Uh, India, the biggest corporate in India, Tata's, in fact, has divested uh, the ownership of its tea gardens in southern India to its workers because they found that more profitable. And they, of course, make their profits out of marketing and processing the tea. But the actual ownership and cultivation of the gardens uh, is left in the hands of workers. But the normal practice is that you don't want these guys to sit with you in discussing company policy. You don't want them to come and argue with you as to whether you should enter a damaged building where uh, building standards and labor standards are not being met. You want an unequal relationship because it enhances your profit-making abilities. But again, at the end, you will end up in the long run paying a very high cost for this. If you can avoid paying that cost in terms of uh, your tranquility, fine. But if your sleep is constantly being disturbed, then you may want to invest in changing the terms of the game. That is really what is going to happen, unfortunately, where you won't have revolutions anymore. But, I mean, what you will have is uh, uh, exceedingly violent episodes or episodes of violence, which are going to become more and more uh, widespread uh, around these regions. So we're going to need to wrap up. We have one final question. Um, my name is Wazi Chaudhary. I'm not an economist rather clear that first. I did study architecture here in this uh, UC Berkeley and got my master's 30 years ago. But as a, just an, an interest in Bangladesh, as a, somebody who was born in Bangladesh, I actually go there and I try to visit a lot of places. And there is a place that's where there was social engineering, an uh, attempt to social engineering in the southern uh, reclaimed part of Bangladesh. There's a place called Chonapur where some of you, many of you may have heard that they reclaimed part of the coastal areas. And they tried to first, uh, and there is a deep, uh, should I say, um, and you now people, people are still tied to the ownership aspect. The, the idea of a collective is something that you will have continued resistance. And they tried to actually give out the land parcels to men. They found out that they were actually married, uh, remarried, and are divorcing their other wives. 
So then they tried to do it, um, give the title to the women. Um, that had a lot of reaction from the locality. And then they tried the uh, collective. Uh, they had created ponds, and then they had uh, housing around it. And these are all reclaimed land. So I saw that. I went to that area 15 years ago. Um, and they, they were building these folders, which is the earthen dams. And this was actually being done under the shadow. The, the, uh, the Dutch government was yeah, yeah. really involved in that. Anyway, yeah, yeah. so I'm not going to go too far on that. But I was going to talk about the real thing that I believe all of these are still, pardon me, saying is, is are kind of utopian ideas until we have the governance issues addressed. And you address that, you know, democratizing the decision making, of course, you would love that. But more importantly, 30 plus years ago, there was a gentleman named Manuel Castells uh, teaching here at UC Berkeley. And he had mentioned that the, in the colonial, post-colonial societies, the privileged class becomes more of colonial rulers. And that's what is happening in Bangladesh, and I presume in India, is these people are not going to sit with the working class. Um, and they will give you, and they're just like our big banks in the United States. You know, they're too big to fail. They will, they will threaten that the left shop will have to basically shut down our operations. And that threat is something that the government cannot deal with. We know that. That happened in Mexico. That happened. I mean, all the big organizations have so much power and clout that even the rulers cannot do anything about it. They defeat the ruling party. And in terms of the Laborers, yeah, they have a term in the United States. I've been living here for 30 some years ever since my Andrew graduated. Um, skin in the game. You know, that's a novel concept. If you make them a partner in your, you know, they also assume the liability and the responsibility. But that's what needs to be worked on. But I think there are too many factors. This whole Bangladesh is competitive only because it is cheap. And Walmart is the, one of the cheapest vendors here. So you're talking about taking profits out of the cheapest vendor, which is going to be a kind of gargantuan task. No, I have no quarrel with anything you have said, and these are realistic issues which needs to be addressed. I mean, at the end of the day, the question is going to be how far those who think they have power are going to be able to sustain it in the dynamics of the social situation. In the post Rana Plaza period, when hundreds of thousands of people, workers were coming on the streets, making demands, now it's related to raising the minimum wage. These same owners were really sort of cowering in their houses and not willing to come out over there and were looking much less powerful than we actually thought they actually looked. Uh, now, at the end of the day, everyone has to do their calculation that how far is a government willing to protect me? Uh, and if a government is not willing to protect me, then I need to come to terms with the people who you think your power is going to keep in position. And what I'm trying to suggest over here is that if you look at the next 10 to 15 years, you have an opportunity of building a harmonious society if you, in fact, uh, give these people, as you say, skin in the game. But essentially, if you think that they are going to simply be the sources of your global competitiveness and you will become uh, a millionaire with apartments in uh, US and UK, uh, this is a game which is not sustainable, even in Bangladesh. And so it's a question of what social price we are willing to pay for, in fact, uh, moving towards a more sustainable system. Uh, but in the current realities of Bangladesh, uh, they don't feel the compulsion. So we'll have to see how this goes. But if you live in Dhaka, you will see that Dhaka isn't as peaceful a place as you might remember from the days of your youth. So Prof Professor Cohen will come and close the event. Please join me in thanking Professor Emerson.
hadn't anticipated such a large and enthusiastic audience. Thank you very much. So before you all rush off to Walmart to take advantage of the monopoly of the global value chain, the transformation of labor from a cost into a liability, um, let me say a few words. Uh, first, I wanted to thank uh, Dr. Soban for his address and for bringing together a diverse group uh, of people, including globally famous economists, um, Berkeley students and faculty, uh, the diversity of uh, professionals in the Bangladeshi community in the Bay Area, and folks from just in the neighborhood. So I'm, um, um, I think it's that uh, combination that, that uh, has come together to create uh, a focus on Bangladesh at Berkeley. Uh, it's a very diverse group of community members of faculty and of others that have come together. Behind that diversity, there's been one person who has been quite extraordinary in pushing and creating this vision and focus. Um, and I wanted to say a word and uh, then to invite um, this person to come up. But I'm speaking of uh, Dr. Ahmad um, Badruzaman. Uh, both Ahmed and Lina Badruzaman have been staunch friends of the Center for South Asia Studies and of Berkeley, giving their time tirelessly to Bangladesh, to the university, and to the Bangladeshi American community here. Um, Dr. Badruzaman is an energy scientist with over 30 years experience. Um, he has uh, been a strong supporter of the Bangla language initiative. Um, he's currently a visiting scholar, in fact, at uh, the center. Before this, he was at Chevron, from where he retired in 2012, where he led research and development on nuclear probes, on many, many uh, to develop local hydrocarbons, and many, many other projects, which he has written many papers and won many awards. Um, he was educated as a physicist in Bangladesh, in Pakistan, and in the US. He earned a PhD from RPI, um, and uh, he has been uh, the vision behind uh, Bangladesh at Berkeley, the initiative. Uh, we are grateful for his time and vision, and I'd like him to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, looks like He's telling me I need. A, I'm looking for a job, which I had. Anyway, uh, uh, I have a long speech here, but I'm not going to give it to you. But I want to. Some people are skeptical about Professor Soban's forward-looking ideas. I remember, as a young undergraduate, some 45 years ago, I found a lot of skeptics when he came up with his idea that Pakistan, as it existed, had two economies. And then he went ahead and came up with a plan to make things better for the eastern part of Pakistan, because that they were the other unequal part of the country. And that led to this so-called six-point program that the Awami League <coughs> came up with. And the Awami leader is credited with all that stuff. But the man who really should be credited is one, he's one of them here. Oh. Yes. So his vision at that time looked unattainable to a lot of Bangladeshis, a lot of Bengalis. You're not going to fight with the Pakistani army. They are very powerful. They are entrenched. And he took them on. His ideas took them on and inspired an entire nation. OK? So, and he has done a lot more to change than many other people that I know of. So today, he, when he comes up and says that we need to do this stuff, I would not discount him. Because I remember as a young guy following his stuff. I am a physicist, so I didn't understand all the economic arguments he made. But one thing I understood as a, as a numbers guy, that Pakistan at the time did not compute. And so the point here he's making, the existing system of economic development that exists, or economic growth that exists in these South Asian countries does not compute it's going to uh, blow up on its face. And as a physicist, you really don't want to increase the entropy. <laughs> OK? So, so I term him as perhaps the key economic thinker for Bangladesh independence some 50, 45 years ago. Today, I also think that he's a key economic thinker on making a change, the world a better place. And so what I would say, what I found John Kennedy said one time, 
We must find time to stop and thank the people who make a difference in our lives. And here's a man who has made a difference in the lives of 170 million people. Thank you very much. Thank you.